Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 116. Today's guest is a legendary television writer. He was an original longtime writer for the late show with David Letterman. He's written and produced for the Dana Carvey show, the Chris Rock show, Jimmy Kimmel live, the Bonnie Hunt show. Norm Macdonald has a, has a show, The Simpsons. And of course, he was a creative consultant on Seinfeld for season seven and eight and credited with writing two episodes, The Pot on the Checks. Please welcome Steve O'Donnell. Steve, thanks for joining. But I, it's my pleasure. I should immediately point out that anyone watching the podcast, the podcastees, should not be under the impression that I was a pillar of the Seinfeld organization. I was much more of like a shingle. Uh, well, uh, two seasons, uh, two, two episodes, a, 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 a half a dozen or a dozen or so plot lines in, in other episodes. But it was a wonderful experience for me. And uh, and I really did have a above and beyond fantastic time the two years I was there. But uh, I know I'm not uh, I'm not a, a foundational <laughs> figure in that particular history. But I well, did have my own little angle on it. I mean, I, I had my own um, uh, experiences. I'll do my best to share those with you. Excellent. Yeah, we'll, def- we'll definitely dig in. I think a common theme on Seinfeld is modesty, so we, we definitely appreciate that. But so yeah, so take us back ninety seven, ninety. Sorry, season seven um, for Seinfeld, nineteen ninety five. Obviously, what a career you've had. You know, Letterman, etc. How did you get the gig with Seinfeld? Was it a, the relationship with Larry or Jerry? Tell us a little bit of how the actual creative consultant role came I, about I, first. I never met Larry until my first day of work when I gave really? him a small fragment of Hitler's car. But I'll get back to that. I knew Jerry, I knew Jerry slightly, I like a, a friendly acquaintance because he came on the Letterman show and was, you know, along with Leno and I must say Carol Liefer and a handful of others considered, you know, prized, you know, just top of the line guests. So I knew him enough to say hello and I think he knew my name. But um, the possibility of going to write there came up, yeah, like 95. And I knew um, uh, Spike Ferriston had worked at Letterman, and he he he, he, he to uh, try to get a, a job there. Uh, and um, there were two writers that I knew. Uh, otherwise, I did not really know uh, anybody. I knew Tom Gamble and Max Cross, um, who had also been in the first few years at encouraging to me i had never written anything like a half hour or sitcoms or anything like that but i did get the job and i was very very uh, uh delighted and pleased and terrified because at letterman you know you you wrote quick jokes and the longest sort of plot you ever had to develop was like in a in a dream flashback during a viewer mail letter and to suddenly find myself in a position where I had to come up with four plot lines, one for each of the main characters that had to twine in and out of each other like some pit of uh, serpents. Um, it was it was uh, daunting, but um, I discovered enough of a capacity for it to last more than a few weeks. So, uh, and, and really uh, such a group. I was felt lucky at Letterman to be around like Meryl Marco. She, she was the original head writer and Jim Downey. They, they were just people that, that you just go, oh my God, if I could try to to write up to their level, the way they're, the, the kind of things they're writing. And at Seinfeld, everybody, that was like everybody, the whole staff, it was to use a, a, a Seinfeld image. It was like the legion of superheroes. They were all fantastic and all pretty experienced in that world. I was also coming in as a rookie uh, uh, into the most popular show that seemed like had ever been. Uh, it had been on every magazine and every TV profile. You know, it was like uh, a phenomena beyond successful at that point. They barely got network notes. You know, the kitchen had two dozen brands of breakfast cereal on the shelves <laughs> that you could pick. It was different from any other show I was at. Like very little executive interference. But there I was. Uh, um, one always feels early on in these writing jobs, do I belong here? Uh, it, everyone was real nice to me. And um, I had the added uh, drag of, of not really wanting to be in California. 
uh, which I've, I've cured myself of. I'm speaking to you from California at this moment. But uh, so I was always like, oh, maybe I want to go back to New York. And so anyway, I was I, I was not half hearted. I wanted to do the best I could. But I, I wasn't. Uh, uh, it was just, just I was a visitor kind of. I was like the, the foreign exchange student. I was like from Bolivia and everyone else was the, uh, the, the, the destined for Ivy League uh, suburban high school seniors. Right. Yeah. I mean, at, at, you're coming in in season seven. So, yeah, like you said, it was already a well-established, obviously well-oiled machine. And it was at, it was pretty much at its peak, getting to its peak of, of um, popularity. I mean, we're, we're, we're fans of the, of the earlier seasons more so probably, but I think I'm probably overall, the one who ruined it. <laughs> no, 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 not, not, not what we're getting at here. But um, oh. I'm curious because, um, you know, you were there for season seven, you know, and season eight. And both of your credited episodes were in season eight. But as you mentioned earlier, you know, you did provide plot lines. Um, what can you remember about that first season you're there? Like you said, you come in, you're, 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 you're new in that in that environment, having come from Letterman and that sort of, you know, talk show writing, writing those kind of jokes. Um, and, you know, the writing staff was was there that you knew. Um, for for Seinfeld, but what do you remember actually pitching and getting in for the first time? Where you were like, "Oh, oh I got well, it! Here well, we go! Um, I'm in." Here again, I have to say, Jerry and Larry were so encouraging. You've probably heard from many other people about the process. It, it, it was Jerry and Larry would come into my office and sit next to my little desk, and I would pitch stories. And there were things they liked right out of the gate. So even though I only had two episodes. There were some things that were like nice surprises. I think the first story I remember pitching was a story for Elaine, where she wants to get a super cheap apartment in Manhattan Plaza, which is like this actor fund supported uh, apartment building where uh, if you're in show business, you can get a special rate. I did not know Larry David had lived in that apartment building. Yeah. So he was very tickled when I pitched that thing. There were a lot of things I didn't didn't realize. I'd only seen five or six episodes of the show, which of course is always terrible when you you think like there are a thousand fans within 10 miles of where I'm sitting at my desk who will probably be better at this than me. But I did, did uh, 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 throw myself uh, wholeheartedly into the pitching of stories. And they were both real nice to me. Whatever else you've heard, you know, like uh, Larry David was, was extremely warm and sweet and playful the whole time. Um, my first day on the job, uh, uh, just to leave that dangling detail about uh, Hitler's car, I, I, uh, I'd already met Jerry several times, but I brought him a, a little wrapped up set of four collections of the Letterman top 10 list that I had edited and put together and written the intros for and put the photos in and everything. Uh, but for Larry, I heard he was a history buff and, and somehow had seen enough of his comedy to have an idea that he might that he might be tickled by this odd um quasi artifact which was a square inch of hitler's car that came with a certificate of authenticity from the uh, uh empress of china casino in las vegas nevada and he was he was amused he was and and we found um comically that history was a little bonding uh um, interest of both of ours. We were both reading the same Truman biography. When he came into my office on the very first day, he saw I had David McCullough's biography of Truman and he was reading that. So we started talking about that. He, he, uh, he, he, he professed uh, an intense love and admiration for Truman in a way I knew was also complimenting himself because he said, he said whatever he wanted. He didn't care whose feelings he hurt. He just said it like it was. You know, and so everyone in Washington hated him. And I, in my uh, shy Midwestern voice, said, yes, not like that nice Cordell Hall. And um, Larry just bellowed with delight. O'Donnell made a Cordell Hall joke. Cordell <laughs> being a, an obscure sort of Truman level uh, politician from the era. So anyway, I don't even know if I, I think Jerry and Larry would remember me but probably as like oh right that the letterman guy who came and went so, well I, not just a letterman guy i mean it's got the resume is incredible steve but what? so see so season no, seven not. season seven larry's there um he leaves after season seven and then you find i guess you finally get uh 
to write a couple episodes. Did you, were you pitching? There, there was, there was a delay. I, I don't, you, maybe you've heard this from the new writers. Both of the, both, both of those, uh, su- the substantial part of those scripts that I had written already uh, in that first season or two or in the interim, it just took a while for them to get into the pipeline. Um, so, and there were things like I, uh, I pitched, a, I pitched a, a story in which everyone's trying to get across town during a St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, and um, Jerry and Larry Weller, no, no, not that, but something, something. Yeah. And, and I think Jerry said, "Make it the Puerto Rican Day parade, and you know, have have Kramer do something god awful and appalling." Um, <laughs> so there were things, in a way, the way I wasn't as. Uh, 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 perfectly fluent in the in the in the uh, idea and language part of Seinfeld, but I had stories here and there. I remember being delighted when I started getting the tiniest little jokes into scripts, um, something where where they wanted Kramer to see behind him while he was walking, and they didn't want like a mirror. And I had suggested like an aluminum pie pan, or maybe a can of those sort of silver paper wrapped Lesseur green beans. And for some reason, mentioning Lesseur green beans <laughs> made Carol Liefer laugh very hard. And I already loved her. So yes, they were they were very welcoming considering what a dunderheaded amateur I was. They were very, very <laughs> nice to Well, it's, but it sounds like you, you didn't really... Uh, watch the show before you joined, right? You said you watched about five episodes. I was, I was working on another show. We had TVs on all the time at at, yeah. at, at Letterman, but but um, because yeah, so how, yeah, so how I, did I you really seen it that much? I've, I've, I've experienced this before, uh, where people go to work on a show that they haven't seen, and that seems crazy. But uh, sometimes it's not so bad. I mean, at the worst, I would pitch something they've done already. Uh, I, I think I pitched somebody getting a, a, a toe or an earlobe or something amputated and having to keep it in the cup of ice. And it was like, what are you doing? We did that already. And I just felt about that. So who, who were you wait, most, wait, who are you I most about that tall? Who are you most comfortable writing for of the, of the big four uh, main characters? And not oh, knowing. Gosh, I, I have to say, I've never thought of that. I suppose I'll compare myself to Dickens. Uh, way, no, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, some part of me is all of them. There's a sort of clean down the middle part of me that is Jerry. And uh, 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 I think George, just because, you know, he's he probably is most like comedy writers, sort of uh, schlubby and self-obsessed. And, uh, right. uh, and um, his story, well, you've, You've heard a million times how they they want stories that it really happened to you. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, and, yeah, exactly. And long before, not long before, but two or three months before I went to take the, the Seinfeld job, I was crossing the street, 72nd and Broadway, and I heard two people talking behind me about a super cheap carpet cleaning service, but you have to listen to their religious spiel. And the other friend said, oh, I can do that. It's worth it. If I can save a couple hundred bucks, I'll absolutely do it. <laughs> and I thought instantly of George and how he'd be mad if they did not give him the spiel. So so that's from the chat. I don't know. I, I, I certainly would never compare myself to the to the uh, uh, kooky uh, doofus hipsterdom of of um, Kramer. Um, and uh, uh, but nevertheless, you 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 find things. I, in, in fact, come now, you're actually shedding light on my on my thought processes because my Kramer stories were not always firsthand. Like um, the 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 Japanese businessman in the drawers, that was just something I'd seen that they did over in Japan, you know, to save money, stay in these little right. coffin like like drawers. So um, that's great. Uh, but I, I do remember another another of my early pitches that Jerry and Larry liked that sort of got into a pipeline and then didn't get onto a into a script was um, I I had the idea that half being a bit of a a, a dope and a jerk and a, a paranoid I, I I I always thought that they made up my Con Edison bills that it wasn't based on anything and some of it was that. During the summertime, they'd go way up, even though I did not have air conditioning. Yeah. I said, they're just counting on me 
So I thought it would be like Kramer to like go on a, 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 a like a strike, not use any electricity at all to catch them in a lie. But his apartment would become like a baking oven, you know, and, <laughs> uh, uh, and there, too, there was some abstract, not experience of my own firsthand where I thought, what if he had gone to a, or a farmer's market and bought organic duck eggs and somehow in the intense heat an oven-like atmosphere of his apartment, they hatched and then <laughs> imp imprinted themselves on him. So I've never had baby ducklings follow me around uh, 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 imprinting on me, but I thought, well, so the, the, the Kramer stories tended to come not from experience, whereas, whereas the others, oh, well, the checks, for example, that was directly from my Letterman world. Uh, uh, they sold the the late night with David Letterman show into syndication with the E network. I don't even know if that exists uh, anymore. But I got this extremely thrilling package, the size of a phone book, that was all checks. And I said, "Oh my God, this thing!" But then I noticed they were for like eleven cents each, and <laughs> seven cents each, and nine cents each. And I said, "There's there's something there." And I think that was the first plot line that they liked that actually then truly got into a into the into the running, you know, because wow. sometimes they'll have the threads, you know, the threads might come from several different places. They're not always from the same uh, writer. Yeah, but I mean, um, <clears throat> what's funny about the checks is that for that episode of Seinfeld, I now get residual checks that are like thirty-one cents and wow. twenty-seven cents, and I just go. Is that is that um, is that postmodern? Is that ironic? What is that? I guess it's just in a meta. Well, yeah, it's crazy. Um, so you just mentioned like four. Like, well, you mentioned the uh, the the drawers, the uh, the checks, and the carpet cleaners all came from the checks. How about the pothole? We, we talked to um, O'Keefe. Who, who uh, well, that was my. Well, you, that was again. Was uh, your, you, you uh, yeah. have, uh, half of you have an O apostrophe in your name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The pothole, Jerry Seinfeld called it the O Seinfeld because it was by Dan O'Keefe and Steve O'Donnell. And and Dan O'Keefe and I never talked or collaborated or you know worked back and forth. That was all the the the, the producers there. I I worked up as many scenes and possibilities and situations and dialogue as I could for my half of it. And the keys was something that had happened to me. I'd been trotting to get home hurriedly, uh, uh, got to my door, patted my pockets, realized it. And I said, they must have, I was jumping and running and jumping curbs. Maybe they're at that curb door. I jumped and I went back and the keys were in a pothole. And I said, wow, what if they'd been, what if they'd been, um, um, paved over? What then? By the way, I, I don't know, um, if, uh, I believe Jerry Seinfeld's tells the truth whenever he speaks, but he told me, maybe just to be nice to me, that that was the second most expensive Seinfeld episode after the finale because it had a cherry picker overhead camera shot. Uh, uh, and it also had, conversely, the up through the toilet water shot. Yeah, And for some reason, which uh, some consultant can tell you, those cost a lot of money. <laughs> More than all the breakfast cereals in the... Uh, it was... Uh, Jerry called it one of his favorite episodes. So the pothole stuff is it's it's great. Do you you're a Cleveland guy? Did were you the one that put Rizzuto in there, or was that a uh, no, no, Larry? No. That seems almost that's almost certainly um, Larry, or maybe Peter Melman. I don't know. I just I think now I sometimes wonder in reruns. Like I wonder if. I wonder if the kids know who Joe Pepitone is. Uh, <laughs> so that the, that the that's names are so perfect. So By good. the way, talking about how nice everybody was, Dave Mandel was like one of the first writers to kind of like really be avuncular and kindly to me and sort of saying, not so, because I'd already been turning in pages and stuff. And he was saying, not so many pop cultural references, you know, no, no references to, uh, you know, uh, the Captain and Tennille, you know, it's like, or if you refer to something, make it older than that, even, you know, Mae right. West or or Louis Armstrong or something. Jane you know, Mansfield so. had some big breasts. <laughs> it, yes, exactly. It, and I don't think that was just so you could rerun it forever. I think it was a sort of interesting aesthetic choice. It made it sort of a weird universe where their tastes and their references, you know, they were all from that sort of 
uh, uh, Gilbert Gottfried podcast kind of aesthetic where everything is sort of, you know, like uh, uh, F troop and Bonanza kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating just to hear. So, so what's interesting to us too, is you mentioned, you know, was it Larry that threw Rizzuto in or was it Melman? But I'm thinking, you know, Larry technically wasn't there in season eight, but we've heard from other people that were there in eight and nine, Larry would pop in here and there. He would yes. be on set. You'd see him talk about yes. maybe when Larry left. I know you just mentioned Mandel. We have heard that sort of, it was Mandel Berg sort of Schaefer kind of, kind of tried to take over. Yes, that, they were Larry role. in charge. Uh, um, also, a lot of this stuff was sort of got into the rough drafts before Larry left. And another reason why I'm a terrible guest and the wrong person to talk to and, and inconsequential is that I was not even present in the uh, office for the I flew out maybe twice that second stretch I did in 97 into 98. Um, uh, uh, because I kept telling them I, I want to go back to New York and they said, well, you can write from home. And so I did do that. I did. So I wasn't even in the offices knowing who was coming and going. I did love my year in the office. It did seem like a dream because it was just more better appointed than any television show I would ever been in before or since. But I suppose that's because they were doing so well and the network didn't mess with them. The only note I can remember the network giving them was when they when they concocted the the, the, the plan to kill George's fiance. That was like, ooh, couldn't she just get really sick? And they were like, which of course wouldn't have worked at all. It's, um, no, everything about it was 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 a joy. It's funny. I went back to the Radford lot um, recently and went down the old fake New York Street, and uh, where they used to have like a chock full of nuts uh, coffee shop was now yeah, yeah. made to look you know, like a Starbucks and what had been like a love store drug store was now, you know, like a CBS. And all I could think was, wow, the old fake neighborhood sure has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, did you speak of the old, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about the checks with Jerry with the umbrella. Was that a, was that a Jerry bit or was that something that happened to you? Like what had that whole umbrella uh, from the check scene come about? Do you remember? I frankly don't remember, I have to say. I think that's going to be probably a Jerry detail. I do know yeah. that there was um, uh, plenty in that that Tom Gamel and Max Cross had their hands in. They were sort of uh, added delightful frosting to almost everything. But um, at the same time, I've, I've seen a lot of other shows, I've been in, worked on a lot of shows where there was more table working. Uh, there was a lot more large chunks of writing done by individual writers I remember it being fairly unusual when they would call everybody into one room and try to come up with a something that would fix a log jam in some plot line or or they suddenly wanted to use one storyline in another script and how could they make this impact the other uh, the other characters though that may have preceded the uh, era in which impact was used as a uh, verb yeah, I mean, I know you just mentioned other shows, how things sort of worked, and we'd be remiss if we didn't kind of touch on that a little bit, uh, having you on, because some of these shows you worked on are obviously, um, you know, huge, impactful shows in, in the comedy world and television, and, and also we were fans of. One in particular that I'm I'm really curious about is the Dana Carvey show, just because of how much oh. talent was involved in that show, and, and well, just I like... It was like so ahead of its time and it just was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but it was so brilliant. I have the DVD. Set. Well, I, just, there's incredible. a connection to Seinfeld there because uh, uh, Spike Ferriston and I uh, uh, went to work on Dana Carvey as partners, but we didn't come in the first week. Um, uh, we came in a couple of weeks in and there were only a, a couple of weeks left. I think we worked on maybe five shows, five of the Dana Carvey shows, including one that has never been seen and isn't even on the DVD collection, which had some very interesting things on it, including something I would give several fingers off my left hand to see, which was, it was a bit where Dana Carvey was playing Jimmy Carter as if Jimmy Carter were just the most surly, vicious, violent asshole that ever was. Oh, wow. And we did a special, uh, we did a little stunt that we could only do once. It was like, this better be right. I was some kind of like hushing, polite, um, you know, producer like backstage or something or a head waiter or something. But there was a wall sized aquarium full of, you know, bubbles and fish and everything. And 
Carvey as Carter grabs me and smashes my head through the glass and the water pours out and we could only do it once. But it came out all right, but I have not seen it since 1997 or 98 or whatever it was we we did it. And it's not in the collections. It was like show number eight or whatever it was. And it was there. And there were some other things on there. I mean, that talk about that writing staff. That was a spectacular writing staff to which Spike Ferriston and I were kind of come latelys. It was like being the in, in the second wave at Omaha Beach or something like, well, OK, it's history, too. but. Yeah, Car- I mean, Carvey, I always thought he would take that that leap or that jump, you know, just based on what he did in Saturday Night Live. Yeah, yeah, um, but it wasn't him. I, he's, he's, he no, was yeah, him. He, I Wonderful. think it was kind of... Um, I, I think it was just, I think... Um, timing. Sketches in prime time after, after Carol Burnett. I think it was just kind of... It's it's like listening to jazz uh, in broad daylight. You know, it's not quite right. Um, by the way, yeah. I, I will I will I will quote uh, uh, one of the most wonderful, funny, lovable oddballs never lived. Norm Macdonald. He claims that it, that he thinks there are only two people in the history of Saturday Night Live who had a good time while they were working on the show. Dana Carvey was one of them because he just got so many. He had more sketches than he could know what to do with, where everyone else was going to go, am I going to get something in this week? Am I going to get something? But Dana just had way more than he ever needed. And the other one was Al Franken, because he just thought Al Franken had a bulletproof ego and nothing could trouble him. And <laughs> I, he admitted that he had fun enough. now and then, but there was just also so much, uh, I guess everyone admits to a certain amount of agony and anxiety. Yeah. And I mean, if you, if you could pull off massive head wound Harry, like Dana Carvey did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, did they do that more than once? You probably don't. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, great stuff. So, I mean, so you, I mean, you've worked at some town, I mean, Letterman for crying out loud. I mean, tell us a little bit about him. Like, I, and again, I know you weren't on the set of Seinfeld much, but we always kind of love to compare kind of ego. I, I was on the know. set. I was on the set enough. I was there the day that uh, uh, that uh, Jerry Stiller was doing La Boca Vista for about an hour and a half. That must be uh, an icon to you guys at this point. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. So we'll get back to Letterman. So, yeah. Tell us a little bit yeah, about some, okay. of the, uh, some of the guest stars you like you interacted with and had fun with. Uh, on side, but Jerry Stiller clearly was amazing. Yes, I mean, I got to know all the cast a little bit, but I have to say it was my style at Letterman and my style at Seinfeld to not to not interfere too much with the with the actors. I just other writers, you know, were not shy about going up to get pictures and so on. I waited till it was someone that really meant something to me, Jonathan Winters or something like that, who was delighted when I told him about how my identical twin brother and I used to memorize his routines and try to repeat them and stuff. Um, uh, I did, there were, uh, to the world at large, minor characters that came on Seinfeld that I was very excited to meet and get to chat with. And there was often time to chat with them. A character actor named Jess White, Jesse White. He was one of the senior citizens down at the, at the, you know, the Florida retirement home, um, you know, in all those episodes with the with the fountain pens and the whatnot. And um, I had loved him because he was in the movie Harvey with Jimmy Stewart. He plays the like madhouse attendant who's always like, come along now, you know, come and then they try to get him into the straitjacket and stuff. And he also did a lot of cartoon voices that were meaningful to me as a kid. He did like a a cartoon crow on Linus the Lionhearted when I was a kid. And he was so delighted that I remembered, you know, when you meet a sort of working character actor, voiceover actor, and you know their resume, they're pleased. And for some reason, I was always more interested in people like that than, uh, I think I've gotten to know the, the numerous uh, Seinfeld guest stars that came and went more since they, they were on the show that, you know, uh, Dana Gould and, the and, and, uh, um, John Heyman, I knew a little bit from the Chris Rock show, uh, who I knew him to be a great and uh, stormy talent. Um, but in the cast, by the way, I should say about Seinfeld, when I arrived and it was such a super success, I expected them to be a little aloof and a little like, uh, I think we got it. 
but they were not. They would they, the, the the director, you know, Andy would say that, that seems pretty good, you know, after two or three takes, and one or another would go, "Can we try it once more? I, I want to try something the next time." They worked really hard. I was struck by it. They could have been at that point. What did you say? Seven seasons in, you know better than I. That they could have been a little slacking off, but they were not at all. And also. They were all starting to raise families. I remember the big news over the year or so that I was there was that uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus was, you know, would, would bring her kids in sometimes to rehearsal. Um, uh, uh, Jason Alexander had a baby boy born while I was there, and one is sort of struck to go, oh yeah, right, they're normal people with lives outside this. You know, I would talk with. Michael Richards about, oh, I, I just took a drive up to Big Sur with my mother to show it. I'm going, whoa. So I had this image in my head of them leading their normal lives. So they were uh, also nice to me, but I don't think any of them uh, at, down the line went, oh, I should get, call up Steve O'Donnell, see if he's got any kind of pilot script for me. So, I, so my friend Spike Ferriston did write a pilot, uh, well, not just a pilot, a whole series for Michael Richards, where he's a detective. Yeah. Um, so did, did Spike, I mean, did he essentially get you the job or like, did you have to interview with Jerry? To like, uh, yeah, no, there was, I, I, Spike encouraged me to to present myself. And then you go through your agents and say, what do you think? And uh, I think they read the uh, script I wrote for Bonnie Hunt. Um, but but, uh, but there is to some extent, a, 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 you know, a, a network of uh, of. of people knowing each other ahead of time. Yeah, does, 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 now, Letterman, like, does Letterman pick up the phone and like bless it or is, or were you guys that close for that to happen? Or I, no? know, I, I think I might've asked Dave if he'd have any problem with it because I was very loyal in that way. You know, like I, uh, I wasn't going to go work on Conan as much as I admired Conan, just because at that point that wouldn't have been the thing to do vis-a-vis Dave. But I think I'd been at Letterman 13 years. So, uh, and if I was going to try half hours in sitcoms, that was the, the, the time to do it. Um, uh, yeah, Spike and I did go, we were partnered on a bunch of things, including what seemed half a dozen failed pilots. Well, not failed, just not picked up. His, um, uh, yeah. Were you we part did, of we his wrote, talk show? We wrote some Space Ghost. Um, oh, yeah. I, I'll only mention the Space Ghost cartoons because one of them was, an, was a, I don't even know if you'd call it a parody. It was sort of a, 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 a loony, Dead on recreation of a of a Letterman show, um, and uh, I, I was anxious to 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 hear if Letterman was amused by it or not. I was very relieved when I heard that he he did laugh at it. So anyway, so Spike, who was with me at Letterman, and then we were partnered through various projects afterwards. He was a little bit of a, um, a, a an, an anchor or at least a, a reassuring, consistent character through my two years as it were at uh at yeah. Seinfeld. and by the way as long as your, your podcast is on seinfeld when spike and i were at letterman i was at his side in what was the germinal moments of of classic scripts we would go we must have had a hundred lunches with the soup nazi and we would laugh over it every time like what a character but spike was the only one who had Use the common yeah. sense to go, I'm going to turn it into their script, you know? Right. And also, I should mention Maria Pope, who was a letterman, started as a, as a like a PA, and then was a writer's assistant, writer, producer, executive producer for a while. Now she's at Jimmy Fallon. But she was the basis for Elaine at, at the Soup Nazi, because for some reason, the Soup Nazi did not like her at all. And she would hesitate over which variety she wanted, and he would cast her away also i think i used her address in the chinese food delivery episode that oh by the way that was happened to me really and truly they're trying to where the the uh, hunan balcony restaurant on the upper west side would not deliver to the south side of west 86th street and i truly did offer to meet them across the street and they said no no we can't get into that so that oh, wow. that 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 may be the last dangling thread of any interest that I can share about the plot lines that actually got on the air. Right. Um, that the, the Chinese restaurant business. Oh, so, um, it, it, and I think in my first script, I used her ad. And I remember an NBC censor. Is that a, oops. I mean, that's not really her address. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but I just said, oh, no, it's a made up address. And I think they censored it out of future uh, uh, versions of the show. But they do. But they do mention it as 86. And I think it's the first time Elaine's address is ever specified. Yeah. And um, uh, only because Maria Pope lived there. So anyway, she's a sort of a, a, a character in this. You know, once you get into the hundred above 100 episodes, you're going to start wanting Arcana like that. Maria right. Pope's connection. <laughs> yeah, I, I know Spike had that, that short-lived talk show, which I actually liked. He had a couple of good bits on that, but it didn't. Uh, it was on Fox or a while back, and never panned it's out. Tough. But it's tough, yeah. yeah. Especially Michael back then, just, it wasn't uh, really. Yeah, I'll compare him to Jonathan Winters in a way. Is like this was somebody that was very hard to find the right kind of show for, yeah. even though clearly there was a lot of manic energy and and even artistry there. Right. You know who but, wasn't um, hard though was well. You mentioned him earlier. Was Norm Macdonald the show on, on Netflix? I know you worked on that. You mentioned Norm earlier. Would be remiss if we didn't bring that up as well. I mean, Norm Norm's, Norm's my all time favorite by far. I actually was there for his uh, Letterman taping, the last one when he got. Oh, to and, uh, yeah. It was just that's yeah, happenstance. Good yeah, it was just happenstance because you don't know what show you're going to go when you get those tickets. And it happened to be that show. Um, and uh, and his book is incredible. His book is like absolutely genius. But, um, you know, just obviously we, uh-huh. had, we had to bring it up because he might be having, a, there's a post humor, uh, you know, special might be coming out and it's pretty it crazy. Is, but it is coming out. I think it's going to air at the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It'll be unusual because, you know, it's he did it in his home and it's there's no audience response or anything but it'll be one of a kind that's for sure Uh, i should also mention with spike ferriston while we were still both letterman writers going to pick up his car at a super cheap garage that was like way the hell over on 11th avenue and the guy spike they couldn't bring him his car and he said but this is a garage i pay to keep my car here and when i want it you should be able to bring it to me right isn't that the idea and the guy said ideally yes ideally and that's just how it i think that's how they did it on, <laughs> that, yeah on the that is how they did. that's a funny i was line, at spike's actually. side when that happened and again in my dim-witted way i was like oh tough luck spike but spike was so tickled by that ideally so yes spike mandel it was that was kind of the new the new group of seinfeld you mentioned gamel and pro so i think they kind of bridged yeah. the gap between the old guys like melman and charles um yes there were some yeah, touching things. Marjorie Gross was still there the first yeah. few months I was there, and she was like, um, she was like Tiny Tim in the uh, Bob Cratchit household. I mean, it, it, that's not a. a it, it, she was so beloved, and everyone was so careful with her. You know, like uh, because you know we'd go down to the rehearsal, and she'd go, "Oh, I can't go that way. There's like four steps that we have to." So she would find some other way around anyway I, I i was moved by the again the love and the respect kind of between the other the other writers and deserved of course and yes yeah, so, uh, so who who would you hang out with who who are you getting lunch with uh you know season seven on the <laughs> set it sounds like you, you know you know melman like who are some of your guys aside from the spikes of the world uh um I remember admiring Peter Melman spectacularly. I don't remember a regular lunch thing. I, I I think I was by myself. I do remember going to Jerry's Deli on Ventura Boulevard, um, walking distance from the Radford lot with uh, Larry David and a couple of the other writers more than once, like three or four times. And to have a lunch at a deli with several Seinfeld writers, that I I can probably die happy just for that. I was I was not a major adornment at that particular booth but it was really fun just to listen to them to, to the, listen to them talk larry picks up the larry picks up the tab on that i hope right i can't even remember such things probably <laughs> yeah, so, again they seem to have things like ice cream cakes in the in the freezer and stuff where we're like I've, I've never encountered this before but this is sort of like i guess if you were you know it's like a uh, King Xerxes at the height of his empire. Or something. I mean, you didn't wait. You didn't get this kind of treatment on Letterman. I mean, he was uh, that was the it show. There was, for there was the, years. The, great, the green room at Letterman until it went to CBS was coffee and soda. There were no no finger sandwiches, no chips, no n- nothing. Uh, and in our own office, uh, late late in the in my uh, tenure there, like in the mid nineties. They introduced bags of potatoes that you could put into the microwave. 
but really no, not, not, not the sort of uh, Island of lost boys treats that you on subsequent shows. Like when I worked on Al Franken show there, the writers would just dump boxes of Oreos into a bowl and pour milk on them and mush them up. And I go like, God, Comedy writers are the worst people in the world, but also the best people in the world. Yeah, I mean, they have infantile <laughs> eating habits, many of them. But maybe that's changing because it's just so much more. Uh, uh, it's 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 not a bunch of uh, antisocial creep men as it was. Well, yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's funny you brought that up about you know comedy writers and sort of their in in you know idiosyncrasies and and just how they operate and things like that and we love talking to writers because of that and and it's interesting too i mean you're you're, you're a har- <laughs> and you're a harvard guy and i know that there's a lot of them out there uh, on the seinfeld staff and i always try and uh, pick their brains about sort of you know what what how that comes about you know what is it that that makes that it's, that, that mind it's, tick it's a paradox it's, yeah it shouldn't be that way at all because harvard is a very earnest serious place but there was that one little oasis of the magazine i think but the fact that it was pre-professional in a way a sort of a west point that you could go there and and it's true tom gamble and max cross i knew from that but a spike i met through letterman he was a berkeley school of music I always like to point out about the Harvard thing because I realized what a privilege and a, and a, and a plus and a, what a boon it was. But I got a, a almost full scholarship, $600 I owed at the end of the four years. Oh, wow. um, uh, and my dad, a welder, I'm the ninth of the 10 kids. I just point that out because I know people are like, oh, fuck. And there were certainly <laughs> cycles where people were going no more. Letterman used to routinely, to his credit, would say no more. Harvard people, no more. And he would say guys, even though we had a Harvard woman, Nell Scavell. Um, but but it, it, there is a, I don't know if there's a, uh, uh, I don't know that there's a consistency in the writing style. I mean, Dave Mandel is a very distinctive style and very different from Tom Gamble and Max Cross. Um, um, so who knows? I don't really know. But it did see, I think it's just because it gives you a chance to work at something in a semi-professional setting before you go out into the real world. Yeah. So maybe that gives you a little bit of confidence or something. I I, I, uh, I will also say for me, there was this this sort of idol and role model named Jim Downey, whose name you may have yeah. heard yeah. just because he's he uh, he uh, exists in a rather large uh, uh, sense over comedy from the late 1970s onwards, Saturday Night Live, especially, but in many, many other areas. Norm MacDonald loved him. I love him. You would love him too. Maybe you do already. Oh, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like yeah. Norm and SNL and, uh, yeah. So, you know, it wasn't Harvard, but Queens College in Oswego. That's where Jerry went, our friend. Um, tell, yeah. If we just touch on Jerry a little bit, I mean, he was kind of the leader of the show there. Jerry, J- uh, Larry left. Um, what do you remember about experiences with Jerry? And like, I know you ran a lot of I, stuff. I, I remember but- early on, he was impressed that I knew the fight song for Massapequa High School. Because <laughs> How do you know that? I had spent the summer visiting a friend in Boston whose roommate had grown up in Massapequa named Murray Elias. I don't know if he's still around, but wow. I remember that it was like a, you know, most fight songs are like, da, 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 da. but Massapequa's was kind of like a detergent jingle. It was like Massapequa will win today. It had a sort of lilt at the end. And Jerry did know the song and he was delighted that I knew it. He was very, very nice to me. He was tickled by me. It may have just been a, uh, an encouraging, positive thinking Dale Carney co- kind of thing. But when he would see me around the office, he would just go, you're my guy, you're my guy. But probably your other hundred guests have all said said that as well. But I mean, I saw him uh, every couple of years after I left the show, he came on the Norm MacDonald podcast and then he came on the Norm MacDonald real show or whatever it was, yeah. the Netflix show. Um, and he was always real, real nice. Although <laughs> At the Netflix show, he would go, what's Steve O'Donnell doing here? There's no writing. There's no writing. <laughs> and I was like, well, there is writing, but we just we just uh, jettisoned it when we decided it was better to just have the interviews. But uh, again, always very, 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 very nice to me. Um, yeah. He had that interest as uh, as Letterman did in the in the in the fancy cars and the fast cars and the Porsches and the whatnot. And I do remember having a great moment walking 
on the uh, streets of Studio City just by myself taking a walk when an orange Porsche pulled up and Jerry Lino says, Steve, hey, how are you? It was like a day off. It was Saturday or Sunday or something. I can't remember if those were days off, but it was a day off. And then it pulled off. And I remember people walking their dog in the other direction were like, was that? Do you? Are you? Do you know him? And it was like, you forget sometimes when you are, are you know, around the clock in the studio to people like, oh, right. They're famous to the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, you talked about a few things earlier. You mentioned the word loyalty. I know you mentioned it as far as yourself and, and, and kind of working for Seinfeld and Letterman. You wanted to make sure that was OK. And we've heard from a lot of different people that have worked on Seinfeld, their loyalty. Um, and just, you know, yesterday was the the, the uh, date of the finale. The, the finale of Seinfeld aired uh, on, on yesterday's wow. date. Yeah. And I'm curious, um, you know, everyone has their thoughts on it, but they did bring back a lot of people for that as far as guest stars and things like that. I don't know if you were, I know you were gone. I got to then. be in the audience. Oh, there you go. So, yeah. That maybe was you enough kind of talk me. about yeah. that. Yeah. If you were. You uh, know, no, well, in. partly that was also like they didn't have to do that when they invited me to, because at that point it was like, well, I, I, I contributed in a sort of tertiary way to the last two seasons, but um, I felt very happy to be in that crowd and and um, to see so many uh, well loved people. I, usually, a, a professional audiences are not good audiences. Letterman used to say that all the time. He didn't want CBS and NBC. He didn't, he didn't want, but th- that that audience I remember being pretty good for that for that finale. Um, so I felt like it, again, in my little bitty way, I was an observer of history, not a, a maker of it, but that I got to see those, 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 that I was at a couple dozen tapings and, and there for the story meetings and there for the wrap up of the, of the incredible run that seemed to me a tremendous blessing. I think I had more substantial contributions to other shows, but I was very, very lucky to get to be uh, 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 a, 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 a buck private in that particular platoon for that particular campaign. Yeah, and listen, I mean, we you said blessed. We were blessed to, to have you as consumers from everything from Letterman, what you did. And listen, there weren't many, there weren't many writers on Seinfeld. Yeah, you wrote two episodes, but I mean, you played a big part. So we just want to thank you and and, and thanks for spending some time with us tonight, Steve. Oh, my thank pleasure. You, my pleasure. Good luck on uh, episode 117. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe we'll get Spike on for that one. Uh, maybe put in a good word for us. <laughs> I will. Spike thank has you, had Steve. the most interesting career. Yeah. He had the longest running talk show that he hosted on Fox. That they, I don't know if that's still true. He used to yeah, assert a great show. I love that doctor. Thank you so much. And he straightened his blue cards just like Letterman. And oh, he, yeah. I mean, I Letterman's mean lin- lin- is lineage. We didn't even get to Kimmel. I mean, you did Kimmel. I mean, uh, Kimmel, all these guys, they all wanted to be Letterman. Like, the lineage oh, my gosh. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Is, is just insane. And, you know, obviously. Yeah, I'm sure that's the only that. reason I worked at the Kimmel. Is <laughs> I was said, saying that before. I'll have him around. <laughs> I was like, I bet like, you that's why he was odd. It was Kimmel like he was hiring a sheepdog that had once belonged to Marlon Brando or something. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Like, that's why he got him on. I was thinking the same thing. That's funny. Well said. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Steve. All right. Bye, guys.